I want to start by mentioning when Jesus, I want to read a passage here in Desire of Ages that has been very precious to me. One of the things that I enjoy is studying the Bible. <laughs> and as I was studying in Genesis 1, I saw Elohim. And not only was Elohim the three persons of the Godhead working so closely together, always in cooperation, it looked as though they were one because they were that close, always cooperating and working together. And so one of the things we learn is that Elohim is the covenant-keeping God. He's always ready to anticipate our needs and to abundantly provide for them. That is comforting. And we have that right there in the very first book, the very first chapter, the very first words to give us that assurance as we read the whole Bible that Elohim is the same today, yesterday, and forever. So whatever we will go through, we will go through with our covenant-keeping God on our side and we on his side. He will say, this is my people. And we will say, this is my God. And I want to mention, too, that he says that he is coming to gather his saints, those that have made a covenant with him by sacrifice. They are his helpmate. He made a covenant with us, and he made it by sacrifice. And we, too, understandingly, when we take our vows in baptism, these are our covenant vows to our God. And so I want to mention here, when I look in Desire of Ages, it shouldn't surprise us at all that our covenant-keeping God would, of course, anticipate our needs. And can you imagine what Jesus' life, when you really think about it, all that he went through for us, and he knew his time here on this earth was coming to a close. And as he looked at his closest disciples, he knew that they did not understand, and they were really not ready for him to leave. Can you imagine the struggle of that? What, what that really speaks to me. Jesus here on page 668, at the bottom of the page, it says, before offering himself as the sacrificial victim, Christ sought for the most essential and most complete gift to bestow upon his followers a gift that would bring within their reach the boundless resources of grace. That's what he wanted for us. That's what he knew it would take. You know, in John 16, 12, he said, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. It says over and over, when you read the Desire of Ages, you, you hear his heart cry for his disciples. And he's, he's wanting to share with them so much. But he is wise. We can take a lesson from Jesus. We need to be very careful in our evangelism. There are statements in the spirit of prophecy that say that we can share truths that people are in no way prepared to receive. What are we doing to them? Are we a little bit like Peter and get out our sword? You know, the sword of the spirit is the word of God. And we get out there and we start using that sword and we cut off people's ears so they can't even hear us. We're defeating our own purpose. How can they hear us? It takes the Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus, when he was thinking about what is the most essential gift, the most complete one, why would it be complete? Why would it be essential? Because they had a work that needed to be done in themselves, his disciples, and not only them, but everybody that should believe on his name through their word. So they had a tremendous change that needed to take place in them. But not only that, they were to actually take up 
when they finally caught the whole idea of what he was trying to do in and through them, at that moment, then they would also need this power working in them, but because it would fill them as it did him, you remember that when Jesus went about, it says there in Acts 10.38, that God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost, and he went about doing good and relieving all those, all those with suffering because they were afflicted of the devil. Jesus, the way that he was successful, it was prophesied of him. He was living to see prophecy be fulfilled in his life that he had learned at his mother's knee, that he had read that the Holy Spirit was instructing him. All of these things, he was living by the word of God because that's the only assurance he had. When, it, when he was facing the grave, he remembered the word said that God would not leave his soul in hell. He knew he would come forth, not because he felt like it, he couldn't see through the portals of the tomb. He could only see by the Holy Spirit telling him the word. Now, where did we get the word? All scripture is given by what? Inspiration of God. The very gift comes from God. It comes through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit moving upon men's hearts. Holy men moving upon their hearts. That's a gift. God anticipates every step of the way what our need will be. And he even provided, we see that, the whole life of Jesus. If we were to call the book The Desire of Ages, we could say the acts of the Holy Spirit as seen in the life of Jesus Christ. And when we look at the book Acts of the Apostles, we say it's the acts of the Holy Spirit as seen in the lives of the disciples. That's what it is. And God has a people at the end of time that he's going to point to and he's going to say, these are my people. These people are living to see prophecy fulfilled in their lives. We are going to see the prophecies we've read of for so long. We're going to see them come to pass. And one of the essential gifts and one of the most complete gifts that we each need and we need to pray for and pray for one another is the Holy Spirit. That's what will make the difference. All through, all through the Bible and all through the spirit of prophecy and then through the desire of ages, you see these two camps of people. You see people leaning unto their own understanding and in all their ways acknowledging themselves instead of him. But then you see another group that's walking by faith, that's walking by prophecy. They're walking through the Holy Spirit's enabling power. They're strengthened in the inner man. You know, I was reading, I've, I've been, I just love to study. And, and you know, it's so interesting because Jesus' brothers, they thought they had something they needed to explain to him. They really did. They thought he just doesn't get it. If he would just not talk about the things he talks about, and if he would just choose these topics, he would be better liked. He would be much more, you know, conducive to, to the success in his kingdom. And they thought that they could counsel him. Walk not in the counsel of the ungodly. There's a lot of them out there. And you'd be surprised. It takes the Holy Spirit to even know what of those good and well-meaning people that think they can help us to stay out of trouble that would try to shape and mold us according to their ideas of what we ought to do. Well, I tell you, this is so interesting because Jesus he, he sought for us the most essential. This was all before he was going to leave. This was the comfort that Jesus needed for his own heart in being able to go before the Father. And you remember that, what did he tell his disciples? He said, it's expedient for you that I go away. 
because he knew he was going to stand before the Father and that we could come to the throne of grace every time and find help in time of need. Well, what else did Jesus know? He knew that now that he had taken physical humanity upon him, he could only be in one place. But he also knew that the Holy Spirit would be available to each one of us. I just love that thought. You know, Jesus knows how. A, a, a complete and perfect gift is that you anticipate the person's need and you exactly can meet it. Only God can do that. Elohim, he can do it. He's the covenant-keeping God. He's not limited by anything save our perverse will. We're the only ones that limit the Holy One of Israel. We turn back. He says, come forward. We're going to go forward by faith. And we're so used to walking by sight that we turn back. But that's what it says there in Psalm 78, 41. But we don't want to limit the Holy One of Israel, not at this time in Earth's history. He's looking for a people that have the faith of Jesus. They have so much faith in their God that they're willing to suffer for him. You know it says that in Philippians 1, 29. It's not only given unto you to believe on him, but to also suffer for his sake. So we need to realize all that live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. That's a prophecy. That's one we're going to see fulfilled in our lives. So we want to gear ourselves. We need this essential gift. We need to be seeking it every day. We need to be praying and asking the spirit of truth to guide us into all truth. Not only theoretically, but experientially. Because that's what it takes to get sealed. They get so settled into the truth that they cannot be moved. And when God sees that, because he's been accomplishing it through the work of the Holy Spirit, you know, we're told that in evangelism, that it's only by the third person of the Godhead that the power of Satan is held in check. That's the one that can do it. So we need to ask every day so that that Holy Spirit, this essential gift that Jesus saw, that he could provide for us, that complete gift, that can hold that one in check. We can't, but that one can. All power. And so it gives us the boundless resources of grace. No boundaries to it. So we ask every day, kneeling before the Lord, we consecrate ourselves to God in the morning. We make this our very first work. We say, take me, O Lord, as wholly thine. I lay all my plans at your feet to be carried out or given up according as your providence shall indicate. We're asking that Holy Spirit to help us to be at the right place in the right time. You know a perfect gift like that? I just love it. The perfect gift understands perfectly all the past all of history, all of the prophetic accomplishments, everything that needs to be understood about the past, he understands it. Isn't that wonderful? Now, not only that, he understands perfectly the future. So Jesus says that he's going to bring all things to your remembrance, the past. He's going to also show you things to come. We're going to see the unrolling of the scroll. He's going to show us. He's going to, we're going to actually walk through these things while we're fulfilling prophecy. But what about the present? Oh, I get so excited. I tell you, there were so many things I wanted to bring out, but I won't possibly have time. Both in the life of Jesus, how Jesus could be at the right place at the right time, speaking to the right person. All of this was orchestrated by the Holy Spirit anointing him that God anointed Jesus and he went about doing good because he was anointed with that Holy Spirit. He had that. Uh, a, a very essential thing in giving a good gift is that you give something that means so much to you and that you know is going to mean so much to them. That's a good gift. 
That's a perfect gift. And it comes down from the Father of Lights. Amen. <laughs> you know, when he's choosing these gifts for us, it's because he loves us. He doesn't want anyone to suffer. He doesn't want anyone to suffer. If you're called to suffer for him, it's not because of any other reason that, but that you are fulfilling a purpose and that you would not choose to have it any other way if you could see the end from the beginning, which he can do, and you could see the glory of the purpose for which you're called. You wouldn't choose to do any different because you're the bride of Christ. You're going to meet his heart's needs. You're going to be the ones that are going to bring in the end of sin and bring in everlasting righteousness. That's what he's been wanting, a group that understands. You know, I was telling someone, Psalm 49, 20, you're gonna, you see these different things and they just jump out at you. Man that is in honor and understandeth that not is like the beasts that perish. But the wise shall understand. We, we heard that this morning, didn't we? The wise shall understand. We're not going to be like those beasts that perish. Why? Because we have the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We have the things that have been written to enlighten us. The things that are going to come. He will show you things to come. The great controversy is that gift to you. Showing you the things that are going to come. He wants you to know. The wise shall understand. When they go through, there's challenges. They understand exactly why they're going through it. They understand what's going to happen, and they understand that once all this has been accomplished, then they can look forward to these events. They've been, they have been told because he loves us. He doesn't want anything to take us by surprise. He wants us to walk into these things intelligently, choosing to be on the side of God. And I just thank the Lord. But so he wants us to also be at the right place at the right time. And when you look at the Bible, I mean, in our daily experience, we've all had these, I'm sure, where you realized how that God had you at the place at the right time. And there were other people that you were supposed to meet that you didn't know. You didn't plan it. But you realized it was a divine appointment. That's the way God wants to do every day. And she says, in Mount of Blessing 84, she says that it will be like throwing that pebble in the pond and those ripples will just start out. And you won't know till the judgment. You won't know till the other side just how far that one encounter went. I mean, you look at this. I was talking about how the contrast between when we have the Holy Spirit and when we don't have the Holy Spirit. You know, when the disciples... When, that, when Jesus and the disciples went to the well and the Samaritan lady was there and the disciples went into Samaria, they went to see or wherever they went, they went to try to get some provisions for them. And Jesus stayed there at the well. It says in Desire of Ages that they didn't see anything promising about Samaria. They couldn't see anything good coming about that and about taking any time for any of that. They didn't have the Holy Spirit. You know, in Education, page 80. Paragraph 1, it says that when God looks at man, he sees infinite possibilities. That is the Holy Spirit in you that can see infinite possibilities. We're too quickly to judge people by what we see. We heard about the powerful testimony that Brother Derek Hall shared with us. How many people would have given up a long time ago. And he was ready to give up, but the Holy Spirit kept saying, no, nope, no. Nope. The Holy Spirit was guiding. And he was listening. And he was being tutored and gone through this whole process. And when he came out the other side, do you think his faith was strengthened? Amazing. What God saw that he didn't see. That looked very unpromising. God can change the hardest heart. And we would be surprised. There are many people out there that we just don't even have a clue are ready to be brought in. They're ready to be brought in. I, I just listened to a, an, um, a really precious story, and I'm just going to mention this in view of B. 
being at the right place at the right time. You know, we don't know, as I said, about throwing that pebble out there and how the ripples will start, but we don't know where they're going to end up because we have no, no idea. But now that things are going viral on the Internet, we've got websites out there, and God is pulling people to those websites. He's saying, look, over here. And in the privacy of their home, they're doing it. <laughs> Nobody's looking over their shoulders. They can read to their heart's content. And you know the Holy Spirit, silence in the soul makes what? The voice of God more what? Distinct. <laughs> and so here is this encounter, this missionary that comes from America, goes overseas, and he's visiting, and they're doing some evangelism. And they go to a restaurant to eat, and they're hungry and they're tired. And one of the co-workers, he comes back and he said, look, you've got to look at these books. There's two books here. They're giving them away free. And the evangelist says, so? <laughs> I mean, like, do we need their books? <laughs> and he says, oh, you've got to look at these. He says, listen, let me, read, let me read the chapter titles to you. So he gets out these chapter titles, and it's just like he's reading from one of our books. I mean, like, we can overcome sin, and about the seventh-day Sabbath, and about all these truths. And he's just, the, the man sitting there says, where did you get that? <laughs> he said, they're giving those books away free here. He said, who wrote that book? And so he turns it, and it doesn't doesn't clue them in, you know, like, who's that? So, th so this evangelist jumps up and he gets the books and he goes over there and he says, who's this man? He asked the, the lady because, of course, they're giving these books away free. He said, who's this man? And she says, he's a retired pastor from, I think she said, Presbyterian pastor, a uh, very dignified man. He's going to be here tomorrow. <laughs> and the evangelist says, I'll be here. I want to meet this man. So he comes the next day, and sure enough, the man's there, and he's got the menu, and he's picking out what he's going to eat. And so he goes right over there to him, and he reaches out his hand, and he shakes his hand, and the man's just like, well, who are you, you know? And uh, he says, did you write these books? And he said, yes. He said, where did you ever get this information? And so when he, the man looks up finally, and he says, oh, and he recognized the evangelist. He says, I've been looking at your materials on the website. Mm -hmm. He said, I just love these materials. He said, I've been studying them for a long time. He said, you know, in my last printing, I printed out 50,000. He said, before that, I printed out 50,000. Two years before that, I printed out 50,000. He had been distributing all these books, our books, our message. He said, I just love these, these materials. And after, after he recognized him, he just shook his hand, you know. That's what I say is God has ways that we don't even have a clue what he's ready to do. But he's looking for consecrated channels through whom he can work. That's what we're told there. That's the greatest praise we can offer God, as it says in Acts of the Apostles 566, is to become consecrated channels through whom he can work. There are so many, many precious statements that tell us that right now, God is moving on people's hearts. And it says, those who respond will become channels of light. Those are the 11th hour workers. Are you praying every day for those 11th hour workers? I get so excited. You go to the selected messages. You read about those 11th hour workers, then when they come in, they're, they're part of that, as it says over there in Second Selected Messages, page 57. You can read about those too. It says they're solid, substantial conversions. What does that mean? It means their hearts are surrendered. They've made a full commitment to God. They're ready for action. You know, action gives me traction for my faith. It does. If you're just talking your faith, you need to have action to go with it. It gives it traction. And you know, as I was pondering some of these things, 
that description there about the 11th hour workers in selected messages, it says that when they come in, they come in knowingly because it says when the battle gets hot, they go to the front. They go to the front. And it says their zeal outstrips ours. Now that's exciting. <laughs> Pray for the 11th hour workers. Pray for them that if you have opportunity to meet and talk with somebody that's 11th hour worker potential, that you'll recognize it. And how are you going to recognize it? Through the Holy Spirit. Every opportunity that we have to do anything for God will be given through the Holy Spirit. That's the way it was in Jesus' life. It was that way when after the disciples were converted, that's the way it will be for us. Because otherwise we'll be just like those that had no Holy Spirit and we will write off all these groups. You know, there's a, an exciting statement in evangelism about the Jews. Have you ever read that? That is something. I read that and I got so excited. I said, you know, we need to be doing more for the Jews. Now, why should we be doing more for the Jews? They understand a lot of truths. They just don't have all the pieces put together in the right way in the puzzle. And we have more pieces than they do because they rejected the Messiah. So their light stopped. But there are people in the Jewish economy that we could reach because when we help them to see the truth as God give it to his last chosen people, it's going to make sense. It's going to say, they're going to say, this makes more sense than anything I ever thought of. The Holy Spirit, you know, those that are led by the Holy Spirit, they are the sons of God. They could be some of those 11th hour works. Can you think of any people that have a Jewish background that have come in that have been mighty workers? Steve Wolberg and a few other people, choice things. I think even Doug Batchelor. Um, you know, there's a lot of them out there. And some of them have passed off the scene that came in before that. But you know, I just want us to really recognize God is the one, because he sees the end from the beginning, and because he's looking for heart conversions, He's looking for those solid, substantial conversions. He's looking for heart commitment. Because why? He can do more through six thoroughly converted than 60 who make a profession. There are numerous statements such as that of what God can do. Did he ever do it before? I think somebody said about the message about Gideon. Sure. That's why it was preserved for us. He can do less is more if it's quality. If it's quality, and the way that it makes quality is spirit-led, spirit-filled. But that comes by asking. And you know, I was, I was reading in last day events some powerful statements. I tell you, everywhere you look, God is preparing us with these understandings. But some of the most powerful statements that I was reading there in last day events about how that God will recognize the fact. And when he recognizes, he's, he's closely monitoring us. It says that in Psalm 14, 2, that God looks down from heaven to see if there are any that do understand and seek after God. And then over in 2 Corinthians 16, 9, and actually both 8 and 9 are good, but I'm just going to share with you 9, and that is that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of those whose heart is perfect toward him. That's what he's looking for. People whose heart is perfect toward him. He can do, he can, he can pour out on them the boundless resources of heaven. And when he does, you talk about a light that's going to light this world. It says that the light will go like fire in the stubble. It will go so fast. The closing and final events will be rapid ones. But right now is our opportunity to be ready for that. He's looking for perfect hearts. Every day, ask him, Lord, give me that heart that you're looking for, that will meet your needs, that will enable you to accomplish your purposes. Self is dead. I'm all behind. I'm ready for anything that you have. 
and strengthen me in the inner man and enlighten me by your spirit. You know, when you think about every aspect of the Holy Spirit, there was one passage I read, and it said, as I was mentioning before in last day events, that he will recognize the fact when the people are ready, that's when he's going to pour it out. But during the time when we are asking, praying now, we are to be accomplishing humbleness of mind, meekness. See, this last action is nothing about us. It's no glory for man. All glory, as it says in the first angel's message, is that we are living for the glory of God. Whether we eat or drink or whatsoever we do, we do all to the glory of God. Our message, you know, when the Holy Spirit comes, it doesn't speak of itself. So when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, we're going to glorify Christ. We're going to point people to Christ and his righteousness and how to get it, how to receive it and be ready to come out and stand among us to be those 11th hour workers. We're going to help them to be those solid, substantial conversions by his grace. I'm sure my time is up. <laughs> well, anyway, may this whet your appetite. Go and study these wonderful truths. There is so much, and they will bless your heart to see what God is waiting. You know, therefore, the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he smile upon you. Let us pray. I'll just stand since I don't have a mic low. Gracious Father in heaven, as we have taken these few moments to think about the wonderful gift that you have for each of us, that is ready for the asking, and that our hearts could become humble and meek, pliable to do your will and your will alone, that all glory would go to God, that we could hasten your coming, that we could meet your needs and reach out, Lord, that we could be the demonstration, and as you have said, that the Holy Spirit would be our enlightener, that the Holy Spirit would teach us and instruct us in the way that we should go, that our God will teach us with discretion. Lord, we need to have wisdom in doing our evangelism, that we would be able to be used of thee to bring in those 11th hour workers that respond at heart, that are solid, substantial conversions. Make us such, Lord. Make us fully thine. We thank you, Lord, for all the ways that you have provided abundantly above all that we could ask or think according to the power that worketh in us, and that you will more than fulfill the expectation of those that put their trust in you. Thank you so much for all you do for your children. In Jesus' name, we gladly present our request. Amen.